In this video, we're going to talk about the origin of cells, and this will be the last in our first uh, unit. This is IV section 1.5. And so the origin of cells is kind of an interesting question, and one that we don't entirely have answers for. Uh, there's a lot of evidence and a lot of experiments that have been done to try to answer these questions, but we don't know exactly. So in this video, I'm going to talk about some of the ideas and um, some of the ways that we think the first cells may have originated based off of the evidence that we have at hand currently. Um, granted, these are obviously able to change, as we've seen in, in past videos and you've probably seen in science. With new information, we can make new explanations based off of that evidence and, and change hypotheses or theories if need be. So a couple of things that you probably already know. Cells can only come from um, pre-existing cells by cell division. Um, but then that begs the question, well, how did the first cells arise from non-living material? And so that's the question that we're going to look at first the, here. In asking this question, there are a number of steps that must have been necessary or required for cells to come from non-living material. And the first would be the production of carbon compounds, specifically sugars and amino acids. <clears throat> the formation of organic material that could be the basis or the building blocks for life. And these compounds had to be produced. And so there's um, a specific experiment that, that was done to try to see if this was possible. Um, and this was originally done by Miller and Urey, two, two scientists who attempted to recreate the atmospheric conditions present on early Earth um, when there was no life living and when it was a very harsh environment um, with volcanic gases and ash in the air and radiation exposure, etc. And so these two scientists recreated or attempted to recreate um, the environment of, of early Earth uh, in a closed environment based off of um, evidence that we have in rock layers and soil samples and whatnot of what we think, what type of gases and what type of um, inorganic materials were present. And in doing this experiment, um, they combined a num number of gases, meth methane gas, uh, water vapor, provided some sparks of electricity to simulate lightning, and they found that they were actually able to produce amino acids and carbon compounds from inorganic materials, inorganic being non-carbon based, um, and they were able to produce these amino acids and carbons. Um, and so this experiment showed that amino acids could actually be produced um, by or in an environment uh, that was very different from what we see today. Uh, later experiments have also confirmed this and also also produced amino acids from similar like conditions. Another possible source of these amino acids or sugars and whatnot, um, could be actually deep sea vents. Uh, they would have the necessary energy and gases to assemble carbon compounds into polymers. Um, so that is, that is one possibility. Um, and so looking at the second step would be the assembly of these carbon compounds into polymers. Deep, deep sea vents would be a possibility um, and, and necess to provide the energy necessary in order for these carbon compounds to, to actually form. A polymer is multiple small pieces put together. It should be like multiple sugars put together or multiple amino acids put together. And we'll actually look at polymers in our next, in our next unit. The third step would be the formation of a membrane. And this is really important in order for a cell or an organism to um, distinguish its internal environment from its external environment. So the internal environment of an enclosed um, item in order for it to be able to have uh, conditions that are separate from, from outside, and that would be very, uh, very necessary. And that could be made possible by uh, phospholipids. They are the small pieces that put together make the bilayer of a cell membrane. And experiments have shown that, uh, that, that bilayers will form vesicles similar to a plasma membrane. Um, so experiments have been done to look at that as well. And lastly would be the development of a means for inheritance. And this is obviously very important in the ability to pass along information from one generation to another. Just like life does today, that ability would be necessary um, for those individuals, not individuals, but those, those things that are more successful to be able to pass on their successful characteristics. And this is made possible, and we know that this is made possible by um, RNA. And more specifically, RNA has the ability to both store genetic information and also carry out reactions to copy itself. Um, RNA 
is uh, can can be enzymes, and enzymes um, are the the parts that can carry out those reactions to copy itself. So it can, if it can can store genetic information, and it can also copy itself, uh, RNA would then have the ability to have inheritable characteristics for natural selection to work upon. And as we'll talk about later in the year, natural selection is the selection of, of individuals that have the characteristics or traits best fit for the environment. So these would be the four steps of the four conditions that would be necessary for cells to develop from non-living material. The next topic that we want to take a look at is the topic of endosymbiotic. And this is really examining and looking at how could advanced eukaryotic cells develop. And there's a lot of evidence uh, that actually supports that prokaryotes um, were engulfed, or early prokaryotes were engulfed or taken into um, larger prokaryotes that eventually resulted in eukaryotes. And how we think this happened is um, if we have a prokaryote cell here that has gotten a little bit bigger and through some inner membrane foldings, um, potentially development of a nucleus, maybe some very basic organelles. And then this larger cell um, traditionally probably would consume other cells in order to acquire energy. But if the cell that it consumed wasn't actually digested and broken down, if that cell remained within the larger cell and formed a symbiotic relationship, um, the small cell would continue to exist inside of the large cell. And so, for example, a great example of this is the mitochondria. Um, it could have been ingested by a larger cell, and then that mitochondria actually then provided energy for the larger cell. Uh, chloroplasts would also be another example of this in plant cells. And so, uh, the evidence that we have is primarily from chloroplasts and mitochondria because they both have their own DNA. Uh, they both have ribosome shapes that are typical of prokaryotes, their size of the ribosomes. They both produce their own uh, proteins, and they also both replicate by division of pre-existing organelles. So those organelles actually divide uh, individually or on their own as well. What also is interesting is the size of chloroplasts and mitochondria is roughly in the same um, range as what you would expect to see prokaryotes, individual prokaryotes. So the size of, of those two organelles and prokaryotes are very similar. And so this is how we think more advanced or eukaryotic cells developed cells with, with organelles is actually by this endosymbiotic theory where the larger cells before they became eukaryotes ingested or took in uh, smaller cells that eventually gave rise to eukaryotic cells. The last thing that we want to talk about in this, in this video is Pasteur's experiment. We've talked about this in class, but it, but it gives us some information about um, spontaneous generation of cells. And it was an experiment done to test that, to see if it was possible for cells to, spontaneous, to spontaneously generate in class, or excuse me, in, in our natural environment now. And so what Pasteur did in this experiment is he took some different uh, flasks with, with broth and he boiled them to kill off any bacteria and he used this kind of swan or S-shaped neck and after boiling the broth, let it sit there and there was no growth. Um, dust particles and stuff uh, that would contain bacteria and microbes would, would get into the, the portion, uh, the top portion here, the open portion, but they would settle in this S-shape. When that experiment was redone and the neck was broken off and dust particles containing microbes and whatnot could actually fall into the area with the broth, it saw lots of uh, my, uh, microbial growth. Um, and so what this suggested or, sh or showed was that no organisms appear spontaneously now on Earth. As we talked about earlier in the video, Earth's early atmospheric conditions were extremely different than what they are today. So now on Earth, it's not possible for spontaneous growth. Um, earlier, before life existed, it very well may have been possible for the spontaneous generation of, of life. Um, and one of the biggest differences between early atmospheric conditions and today's atmospheric conditions is any organic materials that are produced and released into the atmosphere or into the environment are very quickly consumed by living things because there are lots of living things on the planet. Before the development of life, there was obviously no living things. And so this would provide an opportunity for those organic materials to build up, which could then have eventually led to 
um, some development of different living organisms. Now again, to summarize the content of this video, these are just ideas uh, based off scientific evidence that has been collected to explain how life may have arisen on the planet. Uh, we don't know exactly for sure how that did occur. Uh, this is best education, um, educated guesses or hypotheses, uh, theories based off of the evidence that we do have available. So please keep that in mind. This is it for our first unit. Uh, in our next unit, we'll take a closer look at um, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, cell mem um, 